So today I'm speaking with Dr. Eric Juarez, a cognitive scientist and a longtime friend. Eric is currently a fellow at Mount Holyoke College, and his past and present research is highly interdisciplinary and centered around decision making. We spoke about many fascinating topics relevant to his research, including imagination, dreams, psychedelics, and much more. Speaking to Eric was a pleasure, and he has a wealth of knowledge of all things cognitive science. So without further ado, please welcome Eric Juarez. Okay, well, Eric, thank you so much for coming on. It's, it's really great to be doing this with a friend. It's much easier this way. Yeah, I'm, I'm really grateful to, to be here. So, yeah, you just got to Mount Holyoke not long ago, if I'm not mistaken. This is the first semester, which started only recently. So when I was looking around on, the, on your profile at the university, so you're there temporarily, or how does it work? You're there for a lecture for just a year or two? Right, so I am... Uh a visiting uh, lecture. Uh, my official title is um, Mount Holyoke Fellow and Visiting Lecturer. So I am here uh, part of a much larger movement in uh, the Small Liberal Arts College uh, community. It's called the Consortium for Faculty Diversity. And so this program is a two-year program for uh, faculty, um, and it is uh, for people uh, who have just uh, graduated or shortly after they've graduated from their PhDs to uh, prepare faculty to enter uh, the faculty workforce uh, in preparation for making the workforce at small liberal arts colleges, you know, often in New England or the Midwest, uh, where Oftentimes, the students being recruited are more diverse than the faculties that were recruited 40, 50 years ago, mm -hmm. in, some, in some cases. Uh, and uh, so, yeah, part of that, that movement. And yeah, it's an opportunity to really, it's a postdoctoral fellowship. So I am developing new lines of research work um, and also developing as an instructor of record and teaching uh, for uh, the first time as as kind of the main lecturer, which is exciting. That is exciting. So is it does it have a deadline or is it sort of a little bit more flexible? Yeah, so uh, officially the program is two years and then the goal is that within that period I will um, apply to and, and hopefully attain a full-time tenure track position. Do you have anywhere in particular that you're looking or at least hoping to, to get an offer? Um, I have to say, so there are many colleges up in this area here in New England, and I, coming back up here, I really enjoy it. Um, obviously, I'm from uh, Arizona and the West Coast, so would love to, to go back that way. Uh, and then I was in North Carolina previously and would be happy there. Really just about anywhere. I'm, I'm pretty open uh, wherever there's an opportunity um, and, you know, a, a strong community. That's really what I'm looking for. And what I've, I'm really happy that I've found here at Mount Holyoke, even in just the two, three months that I've been here, the support structures that are in place here are amazing. My department is extremely supportive. And ultimately, that's so that's what I'm looking for in in my workplace, and that's uh, so one of my lines of work is related to career decision making. There's a lot of research on finding a career which aligns with your uh, values and which aligns with your kind of broader sense of of personhood, and that's so important here. Just like finding a community where we're not just here to work together. We do things after work. We have lunch together while, at, while we're at work. And uh, so, you know, that's what I've really enjoyed about here. And again, as I'm looking for my next step, I'm very uh, paying very close attention to who are my colleagues and are they people who I want to spend, you know, potentially, right, the uh, tenure track faculty positions, they are long term. So you really want to like the people you're working with. <laughs> mm -hmm. I feel like the, the small liberal arts college environment is very well suited for you. I could very much see you thriving in that environment. So that makes sense. Okay, cool. 
So, I mean, and you're also, you're also the, I mean, your research, as you just alluded to, is focused around career-based decision-making. So it's kind of funny to, to watch yourself apply your, your research knowledge to your own person. So that's kind of cool. So I yep. think it would be, I would be good for anyone who ends up listening just to have an overview from, from your own mouth. I will have given you a bit of an introduction leading into this, but I'd like to hear in your own words, how do you describe yourself professionally, the research you're looking to do? Yeah, so broadly, I situate myself in um, the realm of decision science. Uh, and decision science is an interdisciplinary field that integrates ideas from psychology, economics, uh, computer science, uh, what else goes into it? There are many, many fields that go into it. Um, my uh, my training was in primarily in psychology, but also in cognitive neuroscience. Uh, so understanding uh, the role of uh, the brain in the choices that we make. And uh, the conference that I go to most often actually was just there a couple weeks ago is the neuroeconomics conference. It's, that's uh, a, a community that I work a lot with. I um, mean, uh, my work so that's kind of where it's situated. And my work, what I actually do is uh, I particularly focus on imagination and memory, uh, which are these kind of foundational cognitive psychology topics, um, which again, a lot of my training was in that. And I uh, look at these as strategies for how we make choice. And, and more broadly, I think of kind of an entire theoretical framework, which is uh, when I started my PhD five years ago, was just starting to be kind of a, a theoretical framework, really bridging this link between memory for events or episodic memory and the choices that we make. Uh, and so that's kind of the theoretical framework I am working in, that memory and imagination are fundamental to the choices that we make in our everyday lives, particularly for these major identity forming and uh, identity relevant choices like uh, career choice. So the, the, the first question of many from that that I'd like to ask is last time, you know, leaving high school, you headed off to Harvard. And you were set on physics and film were sort of your key interests. So this quickly becomes a very meta conversation because of the nature of your research. But I'd like to hear how you went from that to this. And was your own experience sort of what I, I just knowing you as well as I do, it, this direction just makes a lot of sense to me. Yeah, absolutely. So, um, yeah, so in high school, I, I took uh, physics first, uh, honors physics first uh, as a, uh, a freshman in high school. I really liked it. I ended up taking astrophysics after that. Um, and so in high school, right, that was uh, one of the most exciting classes that was offered at Desert Mountain. Um, th there were some others that I really enjoyed. Uh, HL Chemistry was another that... Um, I know uh, you also had experience with that class. It was a great class. Um, but that was that was kind of what what I was heading into college, what was top of mind. Uh, and then I took uh, my first college class uh, in physics at Harvard, and it was not at all uh, like Mr. Vining's class. Mm -hmm. um, and I wasn't at all ready for it and, and really just didn't, it didn't click um, in the way that I had thought it would based on my uh, high school experience. And I made a lot of friends through that class because we were all kind of going through the same thing. Like, this is not what we were, this is not what we signed up for. Uh, and, you know, so we, we uh, kind of thinking about this in decision making framework, right? We got some evidence yeah. uh, that uh, was a pretty, um, you know, it was evidence that was maybe pointing us that this wasn't the direction we wanted to spend our entire college careers doing. And I think my interest in physics was really thinking about broad fundamental issues underlying 
you know, everything around us, these, these foundational questions of the world, right? Uh, mm-hmm. This was around the same time as like the Higgs boson discovery. And, um, and in fact, my, uh, my professor of my physics class, like he worked at the, the collider and that was his research. And so I thought like, oh, this is really cool stuff. Uh, but it was so, again, it was so fundamental and basic that it really was stripped from what I was particularly interested, right? And my other major passion I, and to this day continues to be is film. And, um, and psychology was a, a nice intersection, right? It has this thinking about individuals and thinking about societies and how these interact that I was kind of in high school pursuing with this film angle um, with kind of the rigorous uh, empirical process from physics. Um, I would still be able to do math and statistics. Um, and uh, the, the real reason that I ended up in psychology and, and ultimately doing the research I'm doing is, you know, since I was six years old, so I was a first grader, I've been recording my dreams. And that's been something I've been passionate about and really interested in, again, for pretty much my entire life. And while I was taking that physics class, I was also taking a seminar on dreaming uh, from uh, Professor Deirdre Barrett at Harvard, who's one of the world's leading experts on uh, the psychology of dreaming and uh, research on uh, on dreaming in general, um, and uh, through that that course, I had the opportunity to contribute to dream research, and I went to a conference um, with the International Association uh, for the Study of Dreaming, uh, and that experience like it's a conference you get to meet so many new people you get to hear uh presentations from a variety of of people and that uh conference in particular from the iasd uh is very interdisciplinary so they have they have artists they have uh people who are from the humanities they have clinic uh clinicians they have um and they have uh psychologists and neuroscientists and, you know, so I, as I was at this conference talking to different people, I realized that the people who did the research that felt more, most like what I wanted to do were the ones who studied psychology. And so after that summer, I had pretty, pretty much already made the decision I'm not doing physics, but I, I didn't know what I was going to do after that. I could have done film um, or I could have done this other thing. And, and ultimately that's what I did. Um, I still, you know, it, Harvard didn't have double majors at the time I was there. Now they do. If I had, if that existed while I was there, I would have been a double major in mm-hmm. um, what at the time was called visual and environmental studies. Now it's the arts, film and visual studies department. Um, so, you know, I would have done both of those. Uh, and I had, you know, I had the credits to do that. It, it just didn't exist at the time. That's unfortunate. Yeah. Um, but now here I am. I study imagination. I study memory. I study things that are um, very much rooted in what I studied in film, right? I studied documentary. I studied um, films that kind of played with ideas of, of memory and, and, and um yeah, so so those are things that I kind of carried into my research. Mm-hmm. One thing I think is kind of funny is, you know, psychology, for example, at Arizona State, I think it is the most populous major. And when you talk to people, at least at the beginning, they have probably fair to say some pretty inaccurate understandings of what to expect in a career in psychology. But it seems like you perhaps are one of the few people who is doing all of those things for real. All of the, the, the things that captivate people to get into it at the very beginning is, is really your focus, which is pretty special. That's pretty amazing. So I should we should probably let people know the title of your thesis, if I'm not mistaken, is feature, it's Features of Imagination uh, as They Relate to Value-Based Decision-Making. Did yes. Is that more or less correct? Yep. That is, uh, that is, gets the gist of it, I think. Um... Yeah, it would contribute 
is mm, mm, is the verb the word, yeah. I used in that. <laughs> so, I mean, I'm about to ask you maybe one of the more difficult questions I could ask you, which is how would you summarize your dissertation? Yeah, so the, the summary of my dissertation is, well, so I I primarily wrote, there were three three empirical chapters. Uh, and in each chapter, I was looking at uh, how imagination is playing a role in different kinds uh, of decisions. So in the first chapter, or in, in different angles of that. So um, all of them were kind of looking at this broad idea of imagination. And just to define what I mean by imagination, I am coming from a constructive memory background. So this is the idea that memory is not uh, some file drawer that we go and put something uh, and it is exactly representative of, of our past. The constructive model, uh, which is a more accurate representation of, uh, from, from studies that we've done, uh, the constructive model of memory uh, suggests that as we remember, we are kind of reconstructing from uh, the, the constituting pieces. Uh, and that is, that is how we construct our memories. And that constructive model enables us to kind of engage in this process of mental time travel, where we can uh, remember things from our past, but we can also uh, think towards the future. We can also uh, think about alternative presence or alternative past. Um, so uh, the, the constructive model proposes that there are uh, flexible processes of recombination uh, that our memory systems enable us to do. So when I talk about imagination, that is the process that I'm talking about. Uh, and so in, in two of the three chapters, I was looking at future thinking, uh, and then in one of them, I was looking at, at the past. Uh, and uh, so in the first chapter, uh, which was a, a neuroimaging chapter, we looked at uh, uh, kind of the, the simplest way to describe it is we were trying to replicate uh, something, uh, a phenomenon that had been seen in previous literature about uh, imagining the future, promoting more patient choice. Uh, so uh, uh, Jan Peters and Christian Buchel, uh uh, wrote a, a seminal paper uh, in 2010 showing that finding. Um, my uh, undergraduate uh, postdoctor, the postdoctoral researcher who, who supervised my undergraduate work, uh, Roland Benoit and his colleagues, also uh, in, in 2011, they, they published a seminal paper on that. Um, so, you know, there's existing work and, and our contribution, part of it is to do a much larger study with a, a larger age group. Um, so, so across the adult lifespan, 18 to 80, or um, 25 to 80, I should say. And uh, so previous studies were, you know, 30 to 40 people, um, some, some of those studies even smaller. Uh, we're, we're actually still collecting data for this project. So I published on kind of the initial push. We're hoping to collect 180. Um, which in neuroimaging is is a big. lot, I imagine, right? Yeah, yeah, uh, very hard to do. Hence, I published on one subset. Um, but uh, our other uh, major contribution in that chapter uh, was that we had people do an imagination exercise before they went into the scanner. So we had them actually repeat and think through the situations that that might happen in their future uh, in hopes of particularly for older adults to help them crystallize this into uh, some sort of gist or or general form uh, so that it might be easier for them to access while they're um, making uh, choices and we found that you know that didn't really do anything we saw the same general effect um, that had been seen previously in the literature that younger adults are able to, uh, so when younger adults are imagining the future on trials, when that's, that future event is paired with a, a choice between uh, taking 
a smaller amount of money now and a larger amount of money later. Those paired trials, younger adults are are becoming more patient on those trials and uh, compared to when they don't have that paired information. For young, for older adults, we don't see that at all. Um, and uh, so that was kind of, that was the first paper. Uh, the second, um, or first chapter, um, it's not yet, hasn't, hasn't been um, officially published in a journal yet, um, mm-hmm. but, but it will be someday. You will see that. Uh, mm-hmm. The second yeah. chapter uh, comes from work uh, I did with an undergrad. And so that was, in, in my uh, reasoning, is, is the big part of that chapter is here is work demonstrating um, the, the work that undergraduates can do if, you know, now. With proper I'm at, guidance. At a, right. I'm at an undergraduate institution. Here's what students can do if they work with me. And so we... Uh, looked at how imagining the past um, influenced choice, and we looked at the valence of um, specifically, so uh, positive, neutral, and negative uh, events. Um, and we have, we were particularly looking at successes and failures. And ultimately, it was a null result paper, um, but null results are actually very important. My uh, first published paper so this is not in my dissertation, but mm-hmm. the first p- paper I published on um, the correlative triad, which was, uh, which is slash was an idea in the uh, kind of neurochemistry literature that um, dopamine kind of mediates the relationship between age uh, and uh, cognitive performance. So as people get older, cognitive performance declines. And the the idea of the correlative triad is that this change is explained by changes in, in dopamine. And in my first published paper, we found maybe some evidence for one task in one study, um, but we, we didn't see it kind of across the board. And, and particularly it was driven by uh, a lack of correlation between uh, the Uh, dopamine measures and cognitive activity or cognitive um, measures uh, of performance. So null results can get published. Null results are important. So that's that's the second paper, our second chapter. And then the third chapter uh, was kind of new work signaling the direction that I'm going with my research. Uh, And so it was a pilot study on imagination and uh, the role it may uh, play in uh, career choice. Um, and, you know, so it, it was a pilot study. We found, you know, maybe uh, some evidence that um, you, actually imagination makes you a little less likely to, to want um, uh, careers across the board um, when you imagine both an ideal career and a, and a career that you um, might not want, but that you have more information about. Um, so that was kind of interesting, much more work needs to be done on that. Uh, but again, that's work that uh, I'm taking forward into my kind of postdoctoral time and hopefully a uh, tenure track. Uh, nice. Career. Wow. Okay. First of all, pretty amazing stuff, sincerely. And you gave me a lot to work with right there. So to start, you mentioned that it's 25 and above, 25 to 80, I think is what you said. So yep. has there been work, and that's because the brain is, is if, I, if I understand correctly, done developing at 25. So I imagine it's quite a different picture below 25, maybe specifically between 18 and 25. Is there work being done within that age range? And what do you think you can expect to be different? Yeah, so in the 18 to 25 range, um, so yes. So the reason we do 25, right, that's uh, still very much uh, part of adolescence. Um, it's also the the most studied time period, right? That's college students. The vast majority of psychology research is done in the 18 to 22 in particular range, Um, especially around 18 to 19, because those are the students who are taking intro psych freshman year and they are, yes, they're doing it for their tests or for, you know, getting credit in their, intro psych class. Um, so 
has that work been done? What do we see in 18 to 25? For that particular test, again, we see that they are doing what we see in 25 to 30. Um, and, and, you know, so uh, for that particular range, 18 to 25, we do, and again, this particular test, people are already uh, kind of showing this flexibility of, of imagination. And, and actually, I would argue that uh, the imagination procedure probably works very well in, in, in those younger groups, right? And in, in that, in particular, the reason we studied this, we're interested in the older adults. Um, older adults have uh, uh, less uh, episodic memory um, capabilities uh, than younger adults. Uh, that's one of the things that declines, whereas their semantic memory, their memory for facts and information keeps keeps stable and or keeps increasing because there's more information in the world. So um, kind of what's interesting about that particular study is we have these two kinds of memory. One that seems to promote uh, when you're when you pair it with um, with these uh, intertemporal choices seems to promote more patient choice uh, and another type of memory that may be uh, in one study in, in Benoit et al. Uh, 2011, this kind of semantic or just knowing uh, general information. And then uh, our study also is kind of trying to semanticize um, that um, that doesn't seem to work as well. Um, so that that was what we were really going for. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, there's a lot of great work in um, in children and adolescents in the decision in decision making. Um, particularly in the risk and ambiguity domain. There's a lot of work there uh, in particular because, you know, the, there's a lot of interest in, uh, you know, teen behavior and, and um, sure. yeah. all that. So, so that risk, risk and ambiguity, there's quite a bit of research there. So what sort of practical... Like, I don't know if application is necessarily the right way to put it, but do you think this will ultimately end up having an impact on psychiatry, for example, like certain imagination exercises and learning how to actually, depending on the outcome of, of what imagination actually functions to do, is that something that can be sort of trained to the benefit of what you're suggesting? Yeah. So, uh, in fact, these imagination procedures are already being implemented. So uh, one major area that these processes are implemented is in uh, emotional regulation. Um, and in, uh, in, as part of treatment for things like depression, anxiety, or uh, PTSD. Um, so already these imagination procedures are in play. And, and even in the decision-making domain, uh, there's been some work. Um, and again, I, I've read the papers, and I, so I know they've been studied in clinical populations. I assume that uh, maybe they're, they're being uh, implemented, but like, for example, for um, gambling, gambling addiction and smoking in particular, there's a lot of looking at these imagination procedures in smoking. Um, so again, yeah, the, the, the uh, hope is that these procedures are something that can be used uh, for uh, clinical purposes, or just like, again, I, my kind of main, what I think is really interesting are things like career choice, right? Can, how, like, what is useful when we're sitting back and, and trying to make a choice about what career to pursue um, or what, uh, what work we want to, to do? Um, here's like, here are some strategies that might be helpful. Um, and what, what aspects of these strategies are driving the effect. So do you have anything concrete to that end for the time being? How much have you fleshed that, that out? Um, uh, so w which part, if you don't mind me asking? So I mean, sort of like, what would you, what you like, I'll, I'll use yourself as an example. You mentioned that when you were taking physics at Harvard, you, there was some evidence 
that kind of pointed you in the right direction? What evidence were you referring to? Obviously, I think it's quite clear in general, but if you could pinpoint that a little bit. Yeah, so, um, yeah, like, so in, in that case, right, I there was a reflective process involved. And again, that's kind of what, what um, my research is very much descriptive, not prescriptive. Um, and, and I think that that gets to, you know, there are people who are doing this, kind of applying this clinically. I'm really interested in, okay, so what what do people do? What what are the processes involved? So again, in, in that process, right, I was looking at evidence. Uh, in that particular case, the evidence was, uh, I was getting some feedback uh, on exams and things that, you know, this is not, um, it's not working. And, you know, there's, there are kind of two perspectives to that, right? One is you should per- persevere, like, you know, you'll learn and keep improving. Um, but again, at the same time, right? So I was getting some some negative feedback on one thing. And at the same time, in another concurrent experience, I was getting positive feedback. And, you know, so you compare, okay, I'm getting negative feedback on this one and positive feedback on this one. Let me steer to this path where I'm getting uh, positive feedback and um, see how I can grow in that area. And ultimately that's what I did. And, and, um, and yeah, so when I think about this imagination process, I am thinking about, is it possible for people to kind of build out these hypotheticals in a way that they can start to do this process before they even jump into a choice? Um, and so again, some of this in, in has been studied in things like emotion regulation. But yeah, if you consider, okay, here are all the negative consequences that I can imagine this, here are all the positive uh, uh, consequences I can imagine in this. How do these compare? Can I imagine them? How, how do those things make me feel? And then make a choice. Once you encounter either some of those positive feedback or negative feedback, now you have a little bit more uh, preparation. It might even uh, decrease the salience when you encounter that in kind of real experience. And how much how much of the ability to imagine in this way do you think is innate and how much is it learned? Ooh, that is a really good question. Um, so I think the the directed angle is probably more on the learned side um, because generally we don't see that people are are doing like a lot of this reflective process. Um, in terms of just the kind of uh, imagination process, that seems to be pretty unique. That, that, um, and one possible piece of evidence for that is the fact that uh, there are different types of imagination. So there's something called aphantasia, which is a disorder where people um, are unable to generate or create visual imagery. And so a lot of the imagination that I study is foundation foundationally visual imagery. And there's an entire subset of the population who just don't do that at all. Um, and I keep meeting more and more people who have aphantasia. And it's really interesting uh, because uh, there, are, there are a surprising amount in academia and and in uh, the academic world. Uh, so, you know, just an observation, but that's been really interesting uh, to think about that the uh, certainly visual imagery is the dominant form of imagery and imagination, but there are people uh, who have many different forms of this, again, suggesting that there is something probably innate to this process. Well, then one thing that strikes me as a potentially interesting direction is, has there been any research focusing on people with synesthesia, for example, people with a sort of a unique, highly stimulated, highly imaginative capabilities? Yeah. Um, so I know that, uh, there, so again, so there's been work on aphantasia, there's been work on synesthesia. I don't know. I'm not familiar with work specifically like in the, the types of, um, imagination interventions that I'm talking about, like uh, how, how these things affect decision-making, um, 
in individuals who have either kind mm -hmm. of, you know, highly um, imaginative or kind of non-visual image um, mm -hmm. capabilities. I yeah. I see. Yeah, it's, 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 <laughs> This is a direction I think you don't need any expertise to think of a lot of interesting questions and a lot of it's it's very it's the reason why psychology is one of the most popular majors. It's captivating to pretty much everybody. So I definitely can understand. So I want to shift gears slightly because I can't not talk with you about dreams because, of course, that's a, that's a yet another very appealing area. So to introduce that topic, I wanted to see if you remember. So just for some context, again, for anyone listening is uh, Eric and I both had a high school economics teacher, and Eric will know where I'm going quite quickly with this, I'm sure, named Mr. Moore. Fascinating guy, to put it mildly. And uh, he referenced that during his time at Stanford, he participated in a number of dream studies and sleep studies, if I, if I remember correctly. And he claimed that we understand almost nothing about both. And I always wasn't so sure about the accuracy of that statement, so wanted to see how much do we really know about dreams and sleeping for that matter, if you can speak on that as well. Yeah. So, um, so first I'll say that, uh, I, it's so interesting you brought that up because I actually was thinking about Mr. Warren just this morning for, I, I don't even remember why that it came happens. up. He just comes in, he comes into frame sometimes. <laughs> um, yeah. And so I will say at the time he was, uh, well, at the time he was doing those sleep and dream studies, that was certainly the case. Okay. There is so much that we have learned uh, in the past, really even just the past 15 years. Um, and there's still a lot we don't know. Um, we have, a, again, a better idea now of, you know, how sleep might uh, be important. Uh, so we know that there are... Um, for example, memory benefits from uh, naps and and sleep um, in particular, uh, and so that there there's some pretty pretty strong evidence that sleep is a time for reconsolidation of memories, and uh, there's evidence that um, when we dream, particularly in the this uh, the hypnagogic. Um, so this um, kind of pre pre dream pre sleep phase um, that that period is uh, particularly useful, and then also in non REM sleep um, that uh, you know. So the idea again back not that long ago was that. REM sleep is when you dream, that's rapid eye movement sleep, is when you dream, non-REM sleep is when you're not dreaming. We know that actually people do dream in non-REM sleep, um, and uh, those dreams uh, tend to be more these kind of consolidating of memories. Um, and and um, so if you like learn, uh, you know, laboratory tests, um, it's the hyp hypnagogic and non-REM sleep that um, is really important for then getting better at, at those tasks. Um, yeah, and so there are some theories about dreaming, but again, they're theoretical. They're, they're, so why do we dream? There aren't a lot of good uh, answers because it, you know, you get to a point where that's a really big evolutionary question that uh, we can't just figure out from our time point right now. Um, but one idea that, again, based on my research and what I do in waking imagination and um, decision making and, and in the dreaming literature, there's a similar kind of idea that one potential explanation for dreams uh, that, again, this uh, work in memory and learning does play a, a big role in it. So in addition to this kind of memory consolidation uh, idea that's strong in hypnagogic and non-REM sleep, that this kind of unconstrained, uncontrolled uh, imagination that happens during REM sleep might be 
um, helping us prepare. So like this, um, it's the threat. Um, well, I thought I would never forget what this it has threat in the name. And essentially the idea is that uh, dreams are preparatory. Um, REM dreams are preparatory for potential scenarios uh, that could happen. Um, and that the reason that they integrate a lot of bizarre imagery and um, all of that is that it's kind of a way to uh, unleash the most uh, absurd in some ways uh, possibilities that um, one can uh, experience uh, to then, you know, if you wake up and fight a bear, like you've maybe had that experience in a dream. You've run that model, at least in some capacity before. <laughs> yes. Um, yeah. So th th that's one kind of, again, theory about it. Um, but yeah, there's, that is one of those things that's still very much a theory and there's still a lot to learn. But... Is there anything, even even if we don't really know the function or purpose of dreams or why, why and how it originated, is there any research or anything we know more concretely about why sort of the subject matter of dreams? Because, you know, dreams have a weird way of sort of feeling not completely random, like they, they incorporate things from just that day or something that might have crossed your mind just for a moment. Yeah. So, so yes, there are, you know, that's something that has been studied and there are a few uh, different hypotheses and theories. Um, but one of them, again, now I can't remember the name of the theory, but essentially that, yes, like within the first, the, the past three days, that's kind of seems to be the sweet spot is that within three days, there's information that is very relevant to the dream. Um, and, um, and again, some of this might be, uh, you know, if you're consolidating memories, memories that are more recent are particularly important for you to consolidate and um, reflect upon. Mm -hmm. One thing I used to do as a kid, because I, I, I remember picking up on that in some capacity as a child, at least in terms of like anything that was in the front of my mind just before bed wouldn't appear in a dream. And it was something that I would do as like a preventative measure. If there were certain things that I had that, I, that were scaring me in the moment, I would take a moment to, to think about them, scare myself while awake and avoid the terror at night. <laughs> so that's it. It's very interesting. Yeah. So I also saw, I mean, you are actually a bit of a difficult person to, to interview because you don't have one thing that's more fascinating than the rest. Again, you've really focused in on like some of the most attractive subjects, period. <laughs> so I'm sorry for jumping around quite a bit, but I also saw you were doing research about uh, COVID social distancing and the psychological effects there. So if you could just tell me a little bit about that, that would be great. Yeah, so that was a study we did um, um, at the, that was, yeah, back in 2020. Um, so uh, Kendra Seaman, who is the lead author on that paper, had written a paper uh, five-ish years uh, ago um, on um, different uh, types of, again, it was discounting um, and different types of discounting, in particular uh, social uh, discounting. And uh, so then we went um, and re reanalyzed it in, um, in 2020. Uh, yeah, to, re to revisit that work, um, which uh, was, um, yeah, really fun to do to, yeah, uh, look at how things have changed. Uh, so that was one of the things we were looking for. Um, and uh, particularly, we were interested in the older adults. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, we, we still, so, so kind of that original study was about um, older adults, uh, social time and health uh, discounting. And we found that older adults preferred the, um, uh, let's see, so they preferred uh, 
the social rewards, uh, immediate social rewards, and um, the immediate uh, health rewards. Um, it, it wasn't the same for younger adults, um, but they were um, indifferent, um, or were they indifferent or even less, um, for the time rewards. And that's something that's that's been replicated in the time domain. Um, and uh, I believe in our, our COVID distancing, again, we found that same um, difference with older adults. Um, so, you know, one on one hand, replicating what we've seen, but on another, um, really this um, key finding about older adults um, and the relation to social and health decisions. Mm -hmm. And I know you've done, I guess, somewhat related research in terms of the same sort of demographic with exercise and again, looking at dopamine in various capacities. So how does that relate? Yeah, yeah. So I actually, so I reviewed, um, I did a, a kind of commentary on um, exercise and, and dopamine. Um, and uh, so, yeah, one thing that, that we were looking, uh, w one thing that like in my graduate program, we were really interested in these, like what, uh, what effects um, exercise might have on healthy aging. Um, and so there's been a, a lot of work kind of looking at how it's related, what are the mechanisms. Um, yeah, so that's that's a really cool area that, again, I did a little bit of in grad school. I've moved kind of away from sure. that. Um, but, um, you know, so exercise and sleep are two things that are, there's a lot of evidence that they have protective um, protective effects. And so there's a lot of interest in studying these very simple, right? They're simple things that anyone can do, right? You, anyone can sleep, you know, seven hours a night mm -hmm. um, or seven hours, just whenever you can get seven hours of sleep, it's good to get that. Um, and exercise, right? Just getting up and, and um, what what's often studied, um, and in fact, the, the study that we reviewed is it's not like, running a marathon or anything this is just like moderately uh moderately Do vigorous something. walking is the the kind of exercise that's just you know just doing that is um helpful for a bunch of health variables including um you know uh, neuroprotective effects so um yeah those are cool cool applications again simple interventions, uh, simple non, non chemical interventions that, um, again, there's, there's a lot more work that needs to be done, particularly longitudinal work. Uh, cause you know, this is stuff that's gotten interesting in the past, like 10 years, we'd really like to study people who like, here's what they like, how they were exercising or sleeping when they were young. And now what's happening to them. Mm -hmm. Um, we're just like that data is just being collected. I see. You know, maybe it was collected 20 years ago. So we, we really have to wait and see on, on some of these things. But, you know, they can't be bad for you. <laughs> yeah, that much I think we, we know. <laughs> the details, I guess, are still unclear. Yep. So an another thing related to that older demographic that I thought might be interesting to ask you about is, you know, it seems like the focus is largely, you know, like you said, it's just inherently interesting. You're largely driven just by, it's just intrinsically something that appeals to you. But I guess the application would be helping people develop these imaginative skills and make better decisions, at least better rel like as measured by their own satisfaction. But how do you see, or do you see at all an application in, I'm not sure how best to put it, but sort of uh, coming to terms with death, for example, imagining one's ending and like end of life care, let's say in general, do you see a relevance there as well? Yeah, absolutely. I think that's, that is a really valuable lesson, right? So a lot of what the decisions that we've looked at, right, is career choice or retirement savings, but thinking about, okay, so, so then what, right? That, that next thing, um, that is really important. Um, it's also kind of hard to study because like, you know, making people imagine something that could be very like traumatic to think mm -hmm. about is like, you know, trying to get that through an IRB board is a mm -hmm. little, uh, 
and especially people who are older who are you know they're they're even less interested in being in coming to terms with it so abruptly. yeah although i mean one thing about older adults is that that um you know, my advisor did quite a bit work with um, and and is now a very foundational part of that we see often in uh, the literature is that older adults have a positive t- positivity effect. So older adults are much more likely to remember um, and be biased towards things that are positive. So, you know, it might actually not be too bad. They're They're going to kind of, they're better able to kind of, um, uh, readjust and focus on the positives. Uh, so in fact, that might actually play into that, um, those set of decisions. Uh, yeah. I, I also wanted to bring it back to, this is, this is a hot, hot button issue and it's, it's a little overdone. And again, I'm not sure if this is really within the scope of, of what you've been exposed to, but you mentioned, for example, like smoking cessation it was one of the applications you're discussing before. And of course, one of the hot topic issues is psychedelics. And what are their role? And, you know, psilocybin is one of the main things that they're looking at for smoking cessation and all of that. Um, Just curious if you knew anything about that topic, because that's obviously fascinating. And I have friends personally who have gone through, for example, ketamine treatment. I mean, that's a bit different, but in the same vein. Yeah, so I I personally haven't done um, any of that research, uh, but I have a number of colleagues who are either starting that line of work or... Um, are like have proposals ready for as soon as um, there are reductions in the regulation um, will put put those studies through um, in the psychology field, particularly in neuroscience. This is this is the thing right now. Um, they are drastically understudied in part again because you know, almost as soon as they were discovered, you know, within 15, 20, yeah, within 15, 20 years of, uh, um, the, the discovery of synthetic, um, synthetic psychedelics, all psychedelics research was shut down. And so there's just this 50 year gap, 60 year gap of where research could have gone. Um, and, Again, in particular with um, things like SSRIs, which have been the standard of care since the 50s, which, Mm -hmm. again, we really don't know how they work or or why they work. And they they don't their their efficacy is not as strong um, as, again, some preliminary evidence suggests that uh, psychedelics um, may be and um, the side effects um, for psychedelics. Um, at least, you know, in terms of the uh, substances themselves, not withstanding uh, any psychedelic properties, are are typically lower. And so, again, that's why they're of particular interest. Um, and and again, there's a lot of work that's really waiting on the regulatory side. And so that's something again I think about a lot is um, institutional structures that support or kind of push against um, intellectual creativity and, and academic um, research. And that's one where um, there's just been so much uh, so much regulation by, by classifying these drugs in a certain way that um, even doing uh, some really valuable research has has become extremely difficult and causes it to really only be studied in a few places. Uh, and, you know, if there are just certain changes in uh, the way that policy is um, uh, enforced can really drastically change, uh, again, uh, could radically redefine psychiatric research. And how do you see that in terms of its relevance to your own research? Because that seems like a very useful tool for studying imagination. Yeah, yeah. Um, quite frankly, I haven't thought about it at all. Um, you know, so, uh, but uh, yes, now that you bring it up, yeah, it probably has a huge, <laughs> uh, huge impact. So, I mean, if they, uh, again, so 
that's one of the things where uh, in terms of, of regulation and everything, I think even when they, there's some level of deregulation, I have a hard time uh, imagining that they'll uh, really want to do uh, studies on imagination. And, um, but again, I know people who are doing this research and, uh, you know, if it's tied in with other topics, again, trying to understand the mechanisms of like mechanisms of, uh, hallucination probably mm -hmm. rely on certain neural circuits that are related to imagination. And, and, uh, so that is, now that now that you mind me, like that that would be cool. Like if I if I get in touch with the, those people, they might be be willing to to do some studies on that in addition to their what they're actually interested in. Mm -hmm. I mean, it sounds like you have the right connections to begin that work as well. <laughs> so I, I, a final question on this note is that I I his name is escaping me, but Harvard was sort of ground zero for a lot of a lot of this debate in the 50s and 60s and so on, correct? I think, like for example, LSD was synthesized by a Swiss chemist, but again, the the, the his name is escaping me in terms of the professor who ended up. Um, well, yeah, so Tim, and... Timothy Leary and Ram Dass yes. Um, yes. were were you know they were Harvard professors and they were doing all this stuff and then they, you know, they well they got fired and then concurrently went off and had very interesting uh, careers post-Harvard. Mm -hmm. Was there any taboo or sort of stigma around that at Harvard? Did you feel that at all in the department? Not really. Again, I, that wasn't really... It, it wasn't really like, your focus or anything. It so. wasn't my focus and it wasn't... There wasn't a lot of that work being done. Well, obviously, you know, maybe in part because of that, that wasn't really something that, that was kind of hanging over Harvard as much. I read a, an article in the, the Harvard Crimson, which is the student newspaper there, maybe last year, maybe it was even this year, now I can't remember, that there is like a, um, a student organization on psychedelics trying to promote psychedelic research and also just awareness about psychedelics mm -hmm. as treatment, um, et cetera. And um, that kind of, so that in that article was part of, that group trying to come to terms with this history that Harvard plays, this very prominent role that Harvard plays in um, that history of, of uh, regulation and history of, um, you know, research gone wrong. And, um, but yeah, so really my first introduction to that research was I was already in grad school and then I went to uh, the cognitive neuroscience conference and there was um there was a paper from someone who was doing work um, the, in the cognitive neuroscience of, of psychedelics. So, um, and I can't, now I can't remember if that paper, so th this is someone who's worked in psychedelics and now I can't remember. I think actually that was work that wasn't related, but maybe, maybe it was, I, it's been years now. <laughs> sure. Sure. Well, it sounds like you entered the field at the right time, <laughs> no, matter, no matter how you split it. And uh, so I'm trying to keep these conversations to about an hour. So I'll ask you just one final question before we wrap up. And feel free to answer it or not, because I know you, you categorized your own research as uh, descriptive, not prescriptive. But as much as you're comfortable being prescriptive for a moment, from everything you've learned, what would be a piece of advice you'd give to people who are having a hard time sorting out what they want to do in the future career-wise? Yeah, so um, I'm happy to talk about prescriptive things. Like my research mm -hmm. itself is at the point where I would definitely not uh, prescribe anything that I've done. We, there's just not enough work. Um, but other people have studied career decision making, uh, particularly in the counseling psychology field for years. Um, and, you know, uh, so I think there is strong evidence that the the one of the ways to find a career that is satisfying for you, um, and it, it, again, it could be anything, is to look at a job ad or a, a job offer, if, if you're lucky enough to have an offer in hand, and identify the ways that that career aligns with where you see yourself going. Uh, and um, this is actually advice that I was given um, by a career counselors to, um, and actually not just one career counselor, a number have, have said this. This is like classic advice is, again, so this idea of value alignment, but also 
going into a job with a set of goals that you want to learn from that job. Um, and, you know, so it doesn't matter what that job is, right? This could be just like, you know, uh, a first time job, entry level job. It could be uh, a second job. It could be kind of a job that you hope will turn into a career. But going into these experiences with, you know, I want to learn public speaking skills. I want to learn time management. I want to learn um, how to use Python, right? Could be anything, but having kind of key markers for what you want to gain, and that will help you as you go through that job, even if there are things that aren't going so well, you can look back, okay, am I hitting these things? And it also provides kind of, I was talking about feedback earlier, like in my physics class, that's also providing you some feedback. Are you hitting the goals that you set out for yourself? If not, is that something you can ask your, um, your, your boss or manager for? Um, if not, maybe this is, maybe it's time to look for something different. Um, and, uh, so that's, that's a piece of advice that, you know, I have uh, taken to mind and I certainly recommend uh, for for students and for anyone listening who is kind of at a career transition, what to take forward. Yeah, for what it's worth, I definitely agree. And I think ending on a, on a piece of advice is the perfect way to do it. So anyone listening, listen to Eric. He's the man. He knows what he's talking about. But Eric, really, thank you so much. We'll chat a little bit after I hang up, so don't worry. But really, thank you very much. I appreciate you doing this with me. You're welcome. Thanks for having me on. I really appreciate it. Of course.